On this episode of Fisher's Call Sheet, we are diving back into the world of production with someone who really helps shape things and has shaped in my career almost every week, from the Roseanne Show all the way now to the Connors. We have my former stand-in when I was young and a dialogue coach, Elda Lopez. Hi. <laughs> Our story is so kind of intertwined and, yes. and you have been a source of great support and structure for me through the years. Mm -hmm. And I've watched you transition through all these different careers, um, including you're a writer yourself and you've right. written a book. We'll get into that too. Okay. But I kind of like to start, you were my stand-in in the very beginning. I know, that's so crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so as a stand-in, your job is to kind of guide me through what's mm -hmm. going on. An average stand-in kind of works through the scenes, but maybe, what do people think a stand-in does? And then what do you really do in that role? Well, that's a good question. I, I think what people think a stand-in does is they, they just stand there for the actor that they supposedly look like, and that's all they do. They don't know that, well, obviously you and I do not look alike. You're male, I'm female, you were this tall. I wasn't that much taller, <laughs> but still. <laughs> which is why I was standing in for you because I'm short. So that helps because I stand with the children um, most of the time. So what we do is we have to watch the actors who are going through their scene, watch their marks, watch what they do with props, uh, get the directions that the director is throwing out there and trying to make sure we know where we are in relation to camera angles and within the set itself. So there's a lot going on. You have to really, really pay attention. Some people are much more um, precise about what their needs are for a stand-in. Some people do want the same coloring, hair, uh, skin tone, height, weight, you know, uh, more specific terms than not. And others just want a body that they can work with, but who they can depend on to go through the scene and have the skills to do what needs to be done when we're needed on set. Well, I remember back in the early Roseanne days, you were a guide for me about here's where you need to move. Here's an idea of where the camera's going to be. Here's an idea of what the perception was. And really, in a lot of ways, you were an early conduit for me to understand not just blocking, but cameras and the directing side of things. And you in imparted in me such a wealth of wisdom that has been such a gift for me that I try to help newer actors or, or younger people with and kind of pass that forward right well I, I appreciate that michael because back then that was a gazillion years ago <laughs> and i mean i had been in the business for a bit but nonetheless it's nice to know that what i was doing was in the right direction at least so thank you thank you for that absolutely thank you and now you serve as a dialogue coach yes I now, do. what do people think when you say that you're a dialogue coach? What do they think you do? First of all, they hear dialect coach. 100% without a doubt. They hear dialect coach, which is an entirely different thing. That's for voice and speech, which is what I don't do. So what I do as a dialogue coach is I help actors commit the scripted word to memory. You know, which their allowances for improvisation and all that. But whenever a script comes down, I have to make sure I know what the changes are and I have to make sure the actor knows what the changes are so that we can work literally and figuratively from the same page. Just help with memorization and help as they work their way through the character and whatever emotions, whomever the other character is, they need to interact with and how that plays out. So it's just not like I'm okay, here's my script, and just read the lines. And most people don't read words. Well, that's not maybe true. There are a lot of people, a lot of actors who do want the words precise. Others don't. And so you have to be cognizant of that and how an actor works in relation to how you can work together. Yeah, and some writers, you know, depending on the showrunner or the project or some directors, they're really specific about yes. every single word. And some yes. of them are even specific down to commas and, and beats and pauses. Yes. yes. And then others are very open and free flowing and they want you to improvise and add and make the language your own. 
Right, correct. But I can understand as a writer, I mean, you put a lot of work into putting that word on paper mm -hmm. and what that means to you and wanting that to translate. So it's, you know, it can be a little tricky, but for the most part, it there's an intermingling and meshing and understanding and they make allowances for things, depending on the actors you're working with as well. Trying to help people commit things to memory. Everybody has a different style of memorization. Yes. yes. What are some of the things that you see or what are some of the different styles and different tricks you've seen actors use? Well, the most interesting style I've ever seen an actor do, I don't even know if I can explain it, is he asked if I could, once we read through the lines, if we could just read the first line, then go to the second, then come back, read the first line, go to the second line, go to the third line, mm -hmm. or paragraphs or, or whatever, the sections. So it was this reiteration, um, and I'd never done that before. And it wasn't difficult to do it. So like, oh, okay, well, this is different. Let's try it. I've known people, and it's it's kind of a building blocks approach, right? Yes, like you read yes. the first line and then respond, and then you read the second, first and second, then the second and third, and all the way through till you finish the whole scene. And sometimes people want to go through a whole script that way. Yeah, and that's not a bad way to do it, just another way to do it, which is another thing that dialogue coaches have to be uh, aware of is who you're dealing with because not all actors are created equally and you know their styles and personalities and that works both ways so you have to really be sensitive to what their needs are and how they work and how they like to work and what's in their best case scenario and interests to get the job done you know sometimes people just don't mesh and it's not good or bad it just styles just don't mesh and so we have to make allowances for that and if there's somebody else on set who could help them i always offer you know if i'm working with guest cast i know you guys so well but if i'm working with guest cast and i make sure i check in are you okay with this if not we have another dialogue coach who can help you I think it's fair to everyone that way you get the best work out of everyone present you know and what we want the end goal is a great production a great show What's another style of memorization that you're um, experiencing? That was just a first for me. Everyone else is a variation on the theme of they say their lines and, you know, check, double check, and then work from there. Yeah, I have seen people equate lines to shapes or spaces. I've really? seen Yeah, I've seen people ascribe um, letters and numbers to them. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I've seen people describe um, imagery that relates to the emotion or the feeling. You know, this is a sunrise, that's a tree, this is, and it's funny because right. those things don't mean anything to me on the outside because it's not my experience, right? right? Where I may see that line and just simply be, I mean, that's a serious line or a really emotional moment. And I may see a bigger framework, but other mm -hmm. people ascribe things to them. Sometimes that's the way people remember. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't had that experience uh, yet, but I will be on the lookout for it. Thank you. Yeah, and you never know. Uh, I know people, some people like to use a lot of emotion when they're reading, and then some people want almost no emotion. They that's like a good point. Monotone. Yes, that's true, because I, I will, I'll do my best to carry something of the character that they're playing off of into the scene, but some people don't want that. They just want me to read the line straight, They'll do the work, you know, and other people really like that because it helps them build to where they need to go for their character. So I'm good either way. You know, I actually kind of like it when I play the other character. It helps me as background in acting. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun. I don't well, get it right all the time, but still. <laughs> none of us get it right all the time. That's what extra <laughs> takes are for, right? Right. I think it's such a great point. Um, you're really talented. I've watched you through the years. You have a really special connection with acknowledging emotion and depth really quick in my experience with you. Mm -hmm. And I think you're really good at understanding subtlety and underlying emotion for lines and dialogue. You go kind of the, you know, what does they call it? The Rio de Bajo, the Rio, like the <laughs> river beneath the river, like the, you know, the emotion of what should kind of undertone happen. And I, I've always admired that in you is you don't just play kind of surface level. And when you interact with people, 
you give them so much, you can kind of, you scale up and scale down to the target. That's exactly what I do. Very great observation. And that's not losing myself, but it's just adjusting to whom I'm speaking with, whether it's just someone on the set or an actor I'm working with, because I appreciate where they are in their life. And in order to get to know them on another level, which I like to do, you have to kind of speak the same language. Well, that's a great observation. Thanks. I ran in and out of so many scenes back in the day. Uh -huh. Did they ever make you run in and out of stuff the way I did when you were my stand-in? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we don't get to lollygag. There's no lollygagging with us. You got to do what they do. I mean, some of the stuff I've done as a stand-in, especially for kids, Yeah. because you're right, they're all all over the joint, you know? It's like, no, you. this is what you're hired to do. Right. You do it. Although, back in the day, dialogue was not included as a stand-in. It was right. only, you know, um, blocking that was included. But now dialogue is included. So you have to up your game a little, which I'm glad now I have the acting background because it's fun for me as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm a boy. I do a lot of boy stuff as a stand-in, which is so funny, but... It, it, it is interesting. You're, you're such a strong feminine energy, right? And, and a very feminine person, but you've played a lot of male characters for stuff. Yep. And, and you do that with a boldness as well. So it works. You have a strength. I guess it's a strength that can go that is universal. And it also helps if they're paying you to do a job, you got to do your job. Right. You know, when we did the Roseanne uh, reboot, I was standing in for Ames. Mm -hmm. So again, another boy. It doesn't bother me. I just think it's kind of funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you're in demand though because you do such a great job. Oh, all right. We'll go with that. <laughs> all right. What's the best part of being a dialogue coach? Getting to know actors and working with them and seeing how they operate. And, um, you know, I have such a respect for that and everyone's talent um and their growth i've seen so much growth with the actors on our show but 30 years ago we're all young you know you guys were little itty bitty things and so seeing the growth of your person much less your acting person it's been tremendous and and amazing and surreal all at the same time having the opportunity to interact with these people who i really admire but now that they're in front of me and I'm working with them on a personal level, it's, um, it's so enriching. It, it just enriches my life in many, many ways. Um, and even if there's some experiences that are a little iffy, what are they going through right now? Not to say they get to own everything, you know what I mean? Because I, I choose battles, I stick up for myself, but I mostly see what's happening and adapt to what's happening. I have just been working with some amazing people you know, and they're so funny. Everyone has their own personality and you have to um, morph into what works for them. Again, that's another dialogue coach thing that is not, it's not easy. It's not the easiest job. You have to be able to transition gracefully, hopefully. Now, is that the hardest part? No, not for me because like you, I like people. Yeah. So I have a curiosity like, okay, what's happening over here? all right, let's work this, especially if it's something that I'm not used to doing. I learn in the process. I don't think I've had very many experiences where I haven't been able to um, handle myself within the experience, mm -hmm. but there are times when it gets a little tricky, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I just work accordingly, working just accordingly. Now, how long have you been in the entertainment industry, Elda? Oy, 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 oy. Let's see. You know, my very first job, I think I was 24 years old. I'm not going to say how many years ago that was. But I was 24 years old, and I played a little Mexican girl. Kel's surprise, you know. I played a little Mexican girl, and it was for an Airstream trailer commercial. And I was selling wares. I guess we're somewhere in Mexico. And I was selling my wares outside this Airstream trailer. And that was my very first commercial. And that was a long time ago. You've been in this business for a really long time. We've shared, I won't say how long, just a long time, uh, much longer than people would be able to guess. Right. 
when did you know you wanted to be in the entertainment industry? Was there a moment, was something that drew you here? Yes. Shirley Temple was my idol. I love Shirley Temple. Oh my God, I wanted the curls like her. I wanted to dance like her. I wanted, you know, that good shit lollipop. I want, oh, I loved her. I love, love, love. Until the day she died, I loved that woman. Not a lot of controversy. You know, she was always this um, positive, radiant, talented woman. And she morphed into a lot of different um, roles in her life. She did, had some troubles. We all have troubles. But it was Shirley Temple who put me on that acting map. And even I remember as a child, I asked my mom back in the day, they had Shirley Temple dresses. Mm -hmm. I wanted a Shirley Temple dress. And I got a Shirley Temple dress. My hair would never go curly like hers. From that point on, when I saw that little girl, so I think she was two or three at the time, I mm -hmm. want to do that. She was a triple threat. You know, she was a triple threat. I, I'm not, but... Still, she uh, was my inspiration. I didn't know that. Yeah. See, I love learning these things. <laughs> what was your dream coming in to do work like that, to be, to be able to be a triple threat and to do something like that? Or was it more just broad, like wanting to come in and be a performer? It was just wanting to come in and be a performer. I didn't know I could be a triple threat. I didn't know that was a thing, really, until I went along in the business, but I, you know, my voice is great in the shower, great in the car. I can carry a tune here and there, but I'm not that girl and dance. I love to dance. I yes, took a lot of dancing. I love to dance, but stylized dance or routines, I probably could have done it, but I think that comes from a deeper well mm -hmm. than what I was naturally blessed with. Although I, I think I'm just shy of it, but nonetheless, I wanted to um, act is what I really wanted to do. And so that's what I pursued early on. Unfortunately, and I'm not going to use this as an excuse because it's a reality of our business mm -hmm. back then. Okay, I'm going to do the math now. Oh, that's a lot of math. Let's just say you and I had known each other for like 30 some years. And I started when I was 24. Let someone else figure out that math. Right. But diversity wasn't a thing. If you look like me, you were uh, either a maid or a prostitute. You weren't the girl next door or any of that, or a gang leader um, or a gang member. So there weren't that many opportunities back then. And the, that niche was um, already taken by others. And, it, you know, maybe five Latin American, Hispanic, Latinos, Mexicans, whatever they were at the time, were able to really make an impression and work their way through that world. That's really I hard I hate for to me. say it hasn't changed up enough. I know I don't hate to say it. I will say it. It hasn't changed up enough. But there have been inroads that have been I, made. I agree. It's one of those things. It's a real... It's a real point of contention for me. It's a real struggle for me. I, because I was so lucky to grow up with such a diverse group of people and I was able to learn from everyone. I mean, you and I were close essentially my whole life. Mm -hmm. So it's heartbreaking for me to hear the honest truth that I know. But when you hear it, it's painful to me to know that this is your dream, but you're limited because there's not as many points of access and there weren't enough really legitimate characters and right. then to think now as the writer director producer i write characters and i really try to be inclusive because of stories like yours that are so true and because i i don't want the next generation of people not to experience their dream but also i don't want audiences at home to not see people like them in their productions that they watch. And, you know, right. it's a big thing for me. You know, I, I, I try to make sure that I'm always very aware, very supportive. You know, working with Jaden, I'm always making sure that she's comfortable, that we make mm -hmm. sure that she knows she's included. It's so hard mm -hmm. when we look at the history. It's not just this business, but we have an obligation, in my opinion, because we're at the forefront 
because people get to see our work, because our work is so public and we're supposed to portray an authentic presentation of life, mm -hmm. that it's time that we start presenting a truly authentic version of what society looks like, what families look like, what interaction looks like. Exactly. Exactly. Hopefully we'll get to the next level with it. Well, with your help. It helps. I mean, for me, you know, my writing partner and I, we have all these projects and we don't necessarily set out purely with diversity solely in mind, but mm -hmm. the stories that we tell and the people that we grew up with and the stories that we like are really diverse stories. And mm -hmm. as we're going through them, we really want to highlight those elements and the social element so that I think it's easier for people to understand someone else's perspective sometimes when they it's not an argument back and forth or it's not someone they meet when you can see it through television and movies sometimes you can be dropped into a world that you wouldn't have mm -hmm. been able to access on your own and we can open your eyes in a way that is very authentic where you can see really at our core the connection of how much we're alike yes many of these things really the desire to do something great, the desire to chase your dreams, the desire to be included and feel equal, those are universal. Yes, I agree. To be validated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Elda, how did you get into being first a stand-in and then a dialogue coach? Well, it was on our show, Roseanne, the original, and um, the actor who I'm a main uh, coach for, his dialogue coach back then was going to retire. And so she asked me if I wanted to take over the job. Sure, yeah, okay. And I imagine she had to clear it with the actor and that seemed to work out okay. Mm -hmm. So it was really just luck. I don't even know how, it, what happened otherwise. I don't have a clue. You know, because we are sort of a specialized area of the business you don't have a dialogue coach in every single production, which is unfortunate because I've had many actors say, you've been so helpful just having somebody here to run lines with and, and work with and be there on set, you know, on set or in the dressing room or wherever when they're needed. A lot of people consider us a luxury. I think we should just be worked into the everydayness of every production because it would make production go much more smoothly. Well, I'll speak as a performer. I think dialogue coaches are a really valuable asset to a show and Agreed. their value sometimes can't be measured to the outside world, but they also can't be understated to production and how much uh, time is saved effort and energy the quickness at which you can incorporate things because now you have someone to lean on to go to and what people don't see in production and maybe hopefully producers and people watching this will realize is i'll tell you from the performer side probably the world doesn't realize how many problems you solve ahead of time that never make it to becoming a problem because you've good already point. taken care of it and that's a and, very good point you know, that's a very good point. Not to say actors can't do their own work. They can and they have and they will. And uh, that's why they're in the business to do the work. But nonetheless, why not give an added helping hand mm -hmm. when it's just going to help everything overall, help the flow um, and create a more productive environment? I think that it's pretty easy. That's an easy math problem right there. We, we don't work together as much as I probably should lean on you more. Um, and I'm looking forward to opportunities to, you know, I love the way you interact and the way that you give notes and the way that you are a support structure. And sometimes you can see things that other people can't. And you have the ability, especially with the people that you're working closely with, to really hone in on some of those things and catch things that other people may not have. And when you work with really high level performers like you do, Sometimes you can go up and say things to them that no one else might notice or say, and you, you have such a beautiful ease in the way you do it of saying like, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but here's this. Do you want the words on this line 100% or, and sometimes they say, no, I switched that on purpose. And sometimes they say, what, what did I say? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. in the moment, sometimes we, we miss things or, or move things. 
And it's really interesting. Sometimes it really matters. And you have a very gentle touch of guiding back in that direction. And you do a great job of that, Elda. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. That's through trial and error, too. You know, <laughs> definitely through trial and error. But what I do is when an actor such as yourself says a line and it's not what the written word is, and then I give the note, and then you do ask or whomever asks, uh, well, what did I say? I make sure to jot it down because I think that's important. I didn't always used to do that, but I think it's important. So that's not repeated. Or if it is, at least they're conscious of it and they want to make that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get those choices on the page as well. What are some of your most memorable projects you've worked on? That's a big question, Michael. <laughs> well, if I ask you all small ones, it's not as it's not as in depth, right? I have right. to ask you some big ones. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I have to say the one that's most near and dear to my heart has been starting with Roseanne and then coming full circle and then coming out of the circle into another road. You know, it's that's been an amazing, amazing, surreal, fantastic unheard of historical experience this is really probably the most defining project i've ever worked on sure i've worked on things where it's been fun and you meet new people and you gather new friendships as you go and and the great camaraderie on on stage this show is it's fascinating right it's just fascinating <laughs> so i'm i'm thankful very very thankful for it just seeing how everyone has evolved, you know, during, uh, throughout the years and what they've been up to in their lives. And, and it just blows my mind sometimes, <laughs> you know, like you were so little and Sarah and Lisey, they're just little teenagers and just, ah, and they go and they grow and they be and they do. And then we've lost some valuable people along the way. You know, there's Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Yeah. Um, yeah and others um, who leave lasting marks. I'm, I'm sure it, it's just this show and the iterations of Roseanne, you know. Yeah, reiterations and the iterations. All right, now what's one of the strangest things you've seen in your years of working on a set? But no names, we don't have to get anybody into trouble. Strangest thing, oh my God. <laughs> Wait, that's that's an inside joke with myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and a lot of those. Oh yeah, there have been a lot of you know good crazy times. A lot of them had back in the day, you know. Yeah. Um, oh, you were so young, you couldn't participate in all that little. Oh things. no, I know a lot of stuff. Okay, I, yeah. People are always surprised. I think people think I was young and was unaware. I was not unaware. I was super observant. I just either wasn't involved in a lot of it or. Right choose to be very quiet about what I know. Yeah, which is yeah. very smart. <laughs> yeah, it, people have no idea, you know, I, including, you know, I spent a lot of time up in the writer's office and even, you know, late at night upstairs in the floor above our writer's office because you could hear everything through the vents, you know, <laughs> listening to how people would craft a script and, and you know, the way they would pitch jokes because I was fascinated. I wanted to learn because I knew it's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. Now you have wonderlust. You, like me, have this desire to travel and kind of see the world. Yes, 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 yes. If I was independently wealthy, not to say it's never going to happen, but if I was at this, well, not even at this exact moment in time because of pandemic, outside of this, I, you would find me just in another port, in another city, in another country, in another culture, within another culture, learning about who they are, what they are, um, how they came to be. Um, I'm fascinated by all that. And I really love how we can learn from traveling. You know, yes. we, we can learn so much. It adds to our growth as people and, and broadens our horizons internally and externally. It, yeah, huge wanderlust, huge wanderlust. I, you were one of the people who inspired me to look outside of my history books growing up. Really? Because early on, you were the first person I ever remember mentioning the Mayans. Uh -huh. 
back in the day. Right. You started me on this quest for information. And we've had conversations briefly that I don't even know how many you remember over the years, but of bits and pieces of your travel or of other cultures. And so I laugh because I feel like I did the same thing with my daughter. And uh, at some point, Isabel and I are like, we're just going to take some time and kind of step away from the world a little bit and travel the world and just kind of dive in. Because I feel like you learn so much from Mm -hmm. seeing cultures and seeing places, things you can't learn in a book. Exactly. And things that are are valuable towards um, individual growth. You know, I don't think a lot of people realize that we get in our little bubbles, our little comfort zones and don't want to go outside the city limits or outside the county limits or outside the state limits. And there's just a huge world out there. And I'm not going to, um, you know, disparage those people who choose not to do that, but it is worth it to explore it. it, Without a doubt, it's worth it to explore. And I hope to get many more years of that in. Well, I hope to uh, provide work opportunities that lead you to have the freedom. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yay. I hope you do too. Yes. Now, can we talk about personal growth for a moment? Yes, we can. So you're an advocate for personal growth. Yes. I have always been struck that you are someone who is uniquely aware of the growth in people, of the complex way that human beings uh, move in and out of this world. And I feel like you're very introspective and a bit retrospective and are aware. Can you talk to me? for you what personal growth kind of means and things that you wish people knew or explored? Personal growth for me is uh, really based in self-awareness, which I'm a huge proponent of. Once you have a self, once you have self-awareness, then you're able to understand how you interact in the world, how people respond to you, action, reaction, how that impacts your life, if it does, and if it doesn't, should it and what are you missing and it sounds like so much you know like a lot of people go like ah, i don't want to that's a lot of effort i just want to live my life blah 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 but if you're living your life and there are patterns negative patterns that are forming and no one is there to tell you because you're not listening it's hard to get to growth if you're not open to understanding yourself and so i really try to do that not every step of the way because they're, they're, you know you just got to live sometimes and just plateau and be and be normal and and not that you're not normal otherwise but it takes effort and a lot of people don't want to put in the effort or they're afraid to look at themselves and understand why they're reacting the way they are or why others are looking at them a certain way and they just don't want to deal like that this is why i'm that's it well, okay, but is your life suffering because of it? Are you feeling less fulfilled? Or do you know the difference between that? What it's like to be fulfilled and know you've reached another level? You know, for me, it matters. And it will continue to matter. It will. All right, I'm going to ask you advice. I hadn't come into this looking for this, but because (laughs) of your wisdom, what advice would you give me? What are the things that you think be more aware of? take a look at, maybe make an adjustment. You know, Michael, you and I have had so many deep conversations and I'm so appreciative of that because it it allows me into who you are at this stage in your life or even last year or the year before. As an adult, now I know you and I, I, I think you've done an amazing job with what I know you to have gone through and who you are now. I think you need to practice more self-care and just be aware of what that means and how you can do that without feeling you're being selfish. A lot of people think, oh, self-care, what is, I don't even know what that means, you know, or is it all about me? And no, it's not all about you, but it's about taking time for yourself to breathe, stepping away from everything and having to put a boundary here and a boundary there if necessary and say, look, I need this time for myself. I would like to be there for you, but I can't. So this is where I am. I'm going to be here for X amount of minutes, hours, days, but this is what I need in order for me to help further your goal, whatever it is I can help you with. As an example, when I I taught English in Japan, 
and I had a contract there for three months. It was right after the Roseanne show ended. And a week later, two weeks later, I was on the plane to Japan. I was supposed to have a contract for three months. And I got a call that my mother had a rebound of cancer. Mm -hmm. What I chose to do, and a lot of people didn't understand, was that I needed to say goodbye to my students because I'd become attached to them. I needed to take deep breaths. I needed to take these two days before I got on a plane back home. My mother, it wasn't life or death at that time, but it could have been. It was just a new diagnosis, but she had had cancer several times prior. So I knew the drill. I knew what I was in for, which is why I knew that I need to take this time in order to breathe, you know, resolve Japan in a way and then come home so I could be stronger for my mother. And so I would say that to you, if you want to just look at it as not being selfish, because it really isn't. There's good selfish, there's bad selfish. As for you, an individual who needs to breathe, clear their head, have the mental space to um, adapt to whatever may be coming your way, it's important to have self-care. You're always such a source of wisdom. <laughs> and to that end, yes, you have a wealth of wisdom, and somewhere along the way, you became an author. Yes. In between our, our two stints working together. Yes, yes, I did. You wrote this book, The Infidelity Factor, Points to Ponder Before You Cheat, which really is a largely self-help guide, would you say? Yeah, that's a good way to put it of awareness and where you are and evaluating where you are to kind of make sure you have honest conversations that you maintain some integrity kind of question yourself and look at what you want before you make bold steps that may alter or or be detrimental to your life exactly can you tell and, me more about that book and and how that came about and some of the reasons and things in your passion in that area Yes. So it came about um, due to the fact that a certain California governor was found to have had an affair and a child from that affair. And he's not the only guy on the planet, obviously this happened to, but it was just one more in a line of high profile people. And I thought, what? it's so prevalent. Why aren't we doing something about this? I don't understand. You know, everyone says, we'll get married and white picket fence or then we're being unfaithful i don't um, there's a disconnect there's a huge disconnect there and i'd also had the experience my ex-husband cheated on me but i've also been the other woman so i can look at it authentically from both sides i've learned from it thankfully and i'm willing to share those lessons learned as well as my observations through my own growth because when my uh, ex and i had our problem even though Infidelity is a choice. Someone makes an actual choice. They can say it was in the moment, blah, 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 but still you made the choice to go there. So what he did is squarely on him. But I chose to look at my part in the disconnect within our relationship. If I was to have, you know, manifested negative behavior, which I did, then I wanted to be aware of that so I wouldn't repeat it in future relationships because I want a happy relationship. You know, I think everybody wants a happy, healthy relationship. Really, most don't know how to get it. They don't know how to maneuver that. They don't know how to work towards it. We're not taught that. So we're formed by family examples, societal conditioning, religion, culture, and there are a lot of organic conditions, mental conditions too, that I don't uh, address, although they're serious and they do exist. But what I know, and there's anthropological, there's DNA, there's gender stereotypes, there's so much that goes into it. It, it just boggles the mind. But for the broad community, this is all they know. Somebody went outside the relationship, they screwed up, screw you, you know, and, and all kinds of chaos ensues. So I just wanted to have a little practical guide, letting, kind of giving people examples. This is not a healthy example. This is the healthier example. This is what's gonna happen if you do that, more than likely. And so I was just, um, I just wanted to put it out there. 
I think it's really valuable. I think it's a really valuable book. And it's well, a, you read my book, and I've never I had the conversation did. with you of how you liked it. Well, we can we can have some of that right now if you want. Okay, let's. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. So for me, I was married for twenty years, mm-hmm. and when you get married, especially the way I did, I got married young, but I got married with the intention of never. I I didn't have a second choice or a different option in my mind. My goal was I got married and my goal was for that to be a one-time thing and for life. So your book was really enlightening for me um, because actually I was already kind of in the process of kind of the end of my marriage as it was coming to an end. I read your book and I wish I had read it sooner. So it's one of the reasons why I want to highlight it here. Because I think we can fall into negative patterns or negative actions that we may not be aware of. And when you start to grow apart, which I think is a term that people use all the time, Mm -hmm. I think it's great to have some self-awareness and some awareness also like your book really talks about knowing what you want, knowing what what is acceptable to you, understanding what your partner really is asking for and being willing to have those open, tough conversations. Then I will say, you know, I feel like I did a pretty good job of that. I mean, we made it for 20 years and I have two beautiful kids. So I I will never regret that relationship in any way, shape or form. But also I knew I wanted to be in this business and I knew I had dreams I wanted to chase. And I knew her path and my path kind of had diverged, but I wasn't, I kind of was the last person in my home to know. Mm-hmm. And so it was eye opening reading your book because there were things where I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, I hadn't looked at this this way. Or, oh, wow, those were kind of signs of, of separation or disconnection that I, I kind of missed because I was so busy trying to be the firefighter in a way and put out a fire here and a fire there and take care of kids and, and, I was so busy trying to be a good provider. You know, I wish I had communicated maybe better at times or been more patient with certain things, but it also gave me a lot of peace because I was like, okay, I was very honest the whole way. Maybe I'm probably accused of being too honest because <laughs> I, I prefer to just be direct. Mm-hmm. And so it was really interesting for me, you know, when my marriage ended to know I wanted her to be happy. Mm -hmm. I still want her to be happy. She Mm -hmm. has started a new family and she's married and has a whole kind of new life. And I'm really happy for her. And I have no animosity. Largely, I would say some portion of that is from reading your book and having kind of a a better self-awareness that I may not have had otherwise. Then now I've kind of been going back and flipping through it again to certain sections saying, okay, well, if I'm going to start over, I need to make sure that this is in the best healthy way because we're filled with all of this information. Uh, We're imprinted with bits and pieces of our genetics and all of those things, but also our family dynamics growing up then the things we see in the world around us. And then as we grow the things we do in each relationship, sometimes those can become patterns that we really have to evaluate. And I think your book does a great job of really distilling it down and not not preaching, not talking at you, but saying, here's some things and here's things you should consider. And how do you handle this? And what do you think in these scenarios? Which I find in many ways to be a guide to self-help, which is why I wanted to ask you about self-help so much and and Mm self-awareness because it really is the core of it. It really, it really is Uh, because everything starts with us, you know, and how, again, actions, reactions, how we are in the world and what we bring back because of that. And then personal accountability, educating yourself, and then the growth that comes from that. And communication, open honest communication is key, as is intentional listening. And I never knew listening was so important. Um, Listening without interrupting, that's key. Because we all like to think we've got, you know, the answers, we're all, you know. When I started intentionally listening, listening, I found out so much that what my preconceived notion of was not the reality of the other person's reality or situation. And then that brings in empathy and compassion, or it can at least, if we allow that. It should. Yeah, yeah, because that's 
part of it too, compassion and empathy. But those, those are all equal components in it. Now, on the flip side, it's said that you can rebuild a relationship if there's been an infidelity, mm-hmm. but percentages are low because think of all that high emotion. And I'm, this isn't just me talking off the top of my head. I've done a lot of research on this. And so, there's a lot of research in the book for people who see this. There's so much data in the book, but it's not overwhelming. It really is obtainable. It is really digestible and relatable. That's how I wanted to write the book so that anyone could pick it up and just, although I put my own little spin on it, my own little voice into it, but you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. You can have, they say you can have a healthier, intimate relationship once all the cards are on the table, which makes sense. But in order to get there, I mean, you got to go A to Z, Z to A, all points in between. It's a long, hard, winding road, but it can be done. My argument is just do prevention. (laughs) Save yourself a lot of time. That doesn't mean you're not going to learn lessons as you go along. Hopefully you will. A lot of people don't. A lot of people are just too angry and, you know, get the heck out of my life. I'm out of here. I'm going to take you for whatever you're worth. Mm -hmm. Take the kids. This works both ways, Mm -hmm. male and female. And then they don't learn anything from it because they're so deeply wounded. I understand those deep wounds. I really, really do. But I also understand that you have to be able to realize what that was about, what that interaction, that relationship was about and what you can gain or glean from it, the good and the bad, and then move in a positive direction. For me, dependability is a big thing. Um, I'm the kind of person who wants to be there for everybody else and wants to be consistent about it. And, you know, as we got to going in different directions, I wasn't the support structure as much as I was doing it from a financial or in a lot of ways attempting to do emotion, I wasn't connecting the way it wasn't connecting to her. One of the things I got from reading your book was although in my case, it wasn't really about someone else. It really was about just us growing apart. It really made it much more palatable for me and understanding to get to empathy faster. And it made me, I think in some ways a better parent, to really make sure that I was nurturing my daughter through the process because she lives with me. And I also think it's really important. It gave me a real awareness of, I knew before that I have to be a role model or a guide for what she's going to see or look for in the future. Mm -hmm. But I also had to be aware of, I needed to be a guide of being responsible about how I talk about my ex-wife and showing that I still care about her, that she matters, that I respect her mom, regardless that I wasn't going to get bitter or angry. And then also being single, that if I was going to date, that I have to do that in a way that is respectful and indicative of the way I want somebody to come and try to date her. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a lot of areas in your book that really kind of, they definitely made me more aware and made me think about things in a new way and gave me data and information that was very relatable and easy for me to process. Mm -hmm. that I think was bigger than just whether it's fidelity or infidelity. I think it was relationship stuff and communication. And it's, it's a very holistic book that kind of circles around fidelity and infidelity, but it really is about relationships and self-actualization and good communication. Yeah, I would agree with that because you can apply it to uh, business relationships, family relationships, uh, friend relationships, those uh, principles that I write about. Yeah. I'm glad that it helped you, Michael. I really am. Yeah. It's, I think it's a wonderful book and I I really encourage people to read it. So I hope people will check it out and look at the reviews. The reviews are fantastic. What's the first thing you look for on a call sheet? Mm. To see whether my call time has changed or whether the actors I'm working with, uh, their call time has changed. What's the last thing you want to see on a call sheet? My name not on it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) We've all been there, unfortunately. Yes, right? (laughs) What's the one thing you love to see at craft services? I love, I love a few things in craft service. Scones, Earl Grey tea, hot sauce, and jalapenos. Not necessarily in that order, but I love all of them. Now, what do you hate to see at craft services? 
I would hate to not see craft service. I eat, I eat a lot. And so <laughs> for me, and it's, it's also probably a little habitual, you know, something to do in between scenes or whatever I eat. So I'm just so thankful we have food on set. You and I are kind of foodies and, and travel people. So if you, if you have something you're interested in that has food or travel, we're interested in talking about it and sharing and learning about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. How, the, how do you define success? Success. I think it's peace and deep contentment that can at least sustain itself for a while that um, can guide you into next level growth. And joy, certainly joy is always a part of it. But I think joy can be a byproduct of being at peace and deeply content. You know, it's just like oh, you're unburdened and this is great. Life is great. Life is wonderful. Life is wonderful and great every single day we get to live it. But where you really feel grounded in it. I love that. I, I haven't had anybody say peace. That's a really wise sentiment. Thank you. How do you measure up to your definition? Well, like everyone else, I'm a work in progress. I um, try to stay aware, put conscientious effort forth towards it. And I think I'm doing okay. You know, we have days that are better than others, but my algorithm is pretty steady. It's pretty steady. I think you're very good at it. And I hadn't considered it until you said that just a moment ago. I hadn't really considered how often you, especially as a dialogue coach, not just in personal life, but also professional life, you bring other people peace. Oh, I didn't know that. But yeah, be because by providing the care for the people you work with as a dialogue coach, by giving them the comfort and the confidence of knowing that they've been through it, that they know what they want to say and that they have the words readily available to them. It allows them the freedom and the peace to play and to go about their job, which I think is a really, it's just one more way you're successful. It's a really interesting insight. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. What's the one thing you want on every set? Uh, open lines of communication. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. What's the first thing you would eliminate from any set? Unnecessary drama. Oh. Yes, I agree again. <laughs> now you see why I run to Elda for wisdom. <laughs> What's the best thing you've gotten from working on a project? A trove of experiences, just you know, coming at you from every angle. The knowledge um, that you glean from being around different projects and people, the camaraderie, um, the long-lasting friendships. I, I feel incredibly lucky to have gone the road I have um, thus far, although sure, I would have liked to switch it up here and there, certain dreams that I didn't realize, but they morph into something else. So um, yeah, the experiences have been amazing, amazing. Both the good and the bad, because they, they're just a part of it. All right, I'm going to go a little off topic for a okay. moment. Give me an example of a dream, a dream that you wish you could realize because it's not too late. So give me an example of one that you would think, yeah, I'd totally do that. Well, that's funny you asked that. You know, Charlie Nicholson. Yes. Charlie Nicholson and I were asked by the other Charlie slash Carlos, who used to be a writer's PA. What's He's, a play <laughs> He's a playwright. When after he left the show, he had asked Charlie if uh, he would play a certain role and if he knew anyone who could play another role. And Charlie automatically thought of me, not even knowing, I think, that I had acted in my prior life, you know, prior years. So, and I autom automatically said yes for some strange reason. I hadn't acted in quite a while. We did this staged play reading at the complex. So we did a reading there, and this character that I portrayed, she was Latina. She was around my age. I was probably a little older than what the character was state, as stated, but she had a brain, mm -hmm. and she was in politics, and she was, um, you know, in the higher echelon of politics, and she 
was a character you don't see that often. And I had the best time playing her. Charlie played my husband. Mm -hmm. I had a great time. And I brought all those feelings back again. Like, oh my God, look at, you know, I'm in theater again. And, and this feels great. And I love it. And I love this character and blah, 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 blah. I thought for a moment when Charlie and I talked about it after, I said, it scares the shit out of me though to do, can I say shit? I don't know. Yeah. It, scare, it scares the shit out of me to memorize because she had a lot of dialogue. To there are only four characters. She had a lot of dialogue, and I thought, am I going to be able to do that? It frightened me. Mm -hmm. And then when I see what you guys, you know, the dialogue you guys have every week, tons of dialogue, and I, that's one thing I never gave second thought to before, because as an actor, you're going to do that, right? Mm -hmm. It's a roundabout way of answering your question is that I would probably, I would probably do that as a test for myself. And because I like the character, I won't turn anything down, but I have to be, I have to think about it. I, it was an instant moment where I said yes to Charlie, which said something to me, like, what is that? What, what's happening here? You know, um, did I just say, I won't say yes to anything or did I just, I meant to say, I won't say no to anything. Right. Okay. All right. <laughs> I won't say no to anything because what have I got to lose? Actually, I heard you were incredible. You did. I, I've actually heard a little bit about this. Um, I heard about you doing the reading, and I heard you were incredible. Oh, it's probably because I really like the character, and 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 the language was easy for me. The flow was easy. But thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that rumor. Go ahead and spread it. When you do the project, <laughs> I want to be there. Okay. I want to come and support you. Okay. Great. I will, I will give you the invite, yes, yes. if and when it happens. And if not that particular project, something else comes along, yeah. How do you want the people who worked with you to remember you? I want them uh, to remember me as someone who did their job well, who was dependable, and was a decent person to work with. Check, check, check. Yeah. I'll vote that you do all of those exceedingly well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And if I don't, get in my ear and say, hey. <laughs> and vice versa. As okay. always, as I always tell you, tell, tell me if, I don't, if I'm not doing it the right way. Tell yeah. me. I will. All right. What's the legacy you want your loved ones to take from your life? Well, right now, they know me as being um, independent and exploratory internally and externally. So I hope they can look back on my life and think it was one well lived, well intended, and um, little to few stones left unturned, and no words left unsaid. Mm. Most importantly, I would like them to know that they were, without a doubt, that they were truly loved. Now that was beautiful, Elder. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, you, Michael. Um, for, for always being a guide, for being a support structure. Well, you're welcome. Anything I can do, and you help me as well. Your presence helps me as well. Well, that humbles Thank me. You. Thanks for coming on. Sure. Thanks for coming and checking out Fish's Call Sheet. If you liked what you saw, or maybe you want to know more about the entertainment industry, Check out some of our other episodes where we dive into other departments as I celebrate all the amazing people who make production possible.